Good morning, and thank you for coming. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, session, which is a joint session of the Brookings Institution uh, and uh, the Rockefeller Institute uh, of Government. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the results of a five-state study on how competition is working uh, in the uh, Affordable Care Act marketplaces and what we might learn from this study and what, how we think about uh, competition in the marketplaces going forward. And to uh, officially open us uh, up, uh, I uh, welcome my colleague uh, Richard Nathan uh, who, from the Rockefeller Institute to the platform. Thank you, Alice. Uh, I don't work at Brookings, so maybe I shouldn't welcome people, but I worked here 11 years, <laughs> and it's a while ago, and uh, this is one of my favorite places to meet and work with colleagues. It is a pleasure today to welcome you to this conference, as Alice said, the Brookings and Rockefeller Institute Field Network Study of the competitiveness, she mentioned this, of marketplaces and in health insurance, individual non-group health insurance marketplaces in five states. California, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, and Texas. And we have a summary report, and we have five reports, almost big enough for a book, from the five uh, authors or author groups of the individual states that I just mentioned. Each uh, uh, the uh, author of the summary report is uh, Michael Morrissey. Mike is at Texas A&M, did the Texas field research, and is the author, this is my plug, Mike, of a widely used, and I would add current, it's current, it's informative, and it's helpful textbook on health insurance. He is my teacher. I know a lot about the subject, which isn't the subject that I grew up on but I've learned a lot. He's the lead author of our summary report, and Alice Rivlin, who is co-director of the network with the Rockefeller Institute. Tom Gase, the head of the Rockefeller Institute, is here. Worked there a long time, too. Alice is a co-director with me of the Rockefeller uh, Brookings Field Network Research uh, and is the second author of the summary report that Mike is going to present. The writing group includes uh, other people, uh, me and Mark Hall. And Mark Hall is here. He's the author of the North Carolina report. You'll hear from him twice. Mark is the Fred D. and Elizabeth Turnage Professor of Law at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. Copies of the summary report are here today. And I want to add, as I tell you that, that Caitlin Brandt and the staff of the Brookings Institution Center on Public Policy Research have done a wonderful job on organizing this conference and producing these reports in a report that, in a form that I think is very accessible. And I hope you'll download all the reports and read the summary report, and uh, it will hey, be helpful. And, uh, uh, contribute uh, in this uh, turbulent time for health insurance policy making. I've never seen the like of it. The five states that we're studying, and there are 40 states in our whole network, the five states we're studying uh, uh, are different. Uh, uh, the story of what is happening uh, in the country, throughout the country, in states, that, but not only in states, is Michael Weinberg, my, our California uh, colleague, often reminds me, uh, in local markets, Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local, is, he said. And indeed, uh, health insurance markets are local. E even within markets, there are differences that we've learned about and we've written about. We're out in the field, in depth, interviewing experts, using every piece of economic, demographic, and program data we can bring to bear to understand 
institutional change. When something as big as this happens, institutions change. Governments change their roles, state governments, federal governments. Health insurers change their roles. Providers change their role. Advocates change their roles. So you need to not only know the numbers, but you need to know the numbers and put them together with understanding of what is happening in implementation. And uh, that's a, a big subject that I'll just uh, touch on. Uh, but anyway, this is typical of American federalism. And uh, we will have a chance today to hear next from Mike present our summary findings. And that will be followed by a panel of individual field researchers. What they see, what they wrote about, how their story fits into the overall story. That panel will be uh, moderated by my colleague. Uh, uh, we've spent a lot of time working together, Tom Gase of the Rockefeller Institute. Alice will chair a second panel of national experts on health insurance, people who can look at our work and help us think about what we're learning, along with two of our associates, Michael Luke uh, from Colorado, who is the head of the Colorado Health Institute, which is a very strong group. Almost many states have health institutes, and they're very valuable resources for the kind of work we do because they have all the expertise and all the local and state and regional knowledge to understand what is happening to any policy as it plays out in a country as big and complicated as ours with a federal structure. Our new studies uh, focus on the changed role, particularly of insurance companies. They're doing something different now. Uh, you've got, uh, 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 you've got uh, a moment in which you, they're banned from doing uh, medical underwriting, and so everybody can come in, pre-existing conditions, and guaranteed issue. That's, that is fundamental to the health insurance, and the health insurance is as big, if not bigger than any other industry and sector in our economy. So we've been, for five years, I've been, I started this five years ago and I thought I retired. My wife said, no, you really didn't. Uh, set up this network. We have 40 people on the Rockefeller Institute website. Bob Bullock from the Rockefeller Institute is here. We've issued 27 baseline and follow-up reports on what states decided to do. We expected most of them would say, we're not letting the feds in here, we're going to do it. But uh, indeed, the feds are operating most of the marketplaces. So this gets to the heart of how American health care has changed institutionally, institutionally and relying heavily on many sources of data and many people's expertise. We've examined 25 local markets, five in each of the states, and you can read in the, the reports, you can read about that. So I turn next to my colleague, Mike Morrissey, and my teacher. He will describe what we have learned collaboratively about health insurance market competition, based, as I said, on closely examining national, state, and local economic, demographic, and financial data, and extensive interviews with different people in different places in the world of health care in America. How have the exchanges worked? How are they working now? How are they not working? What do we know about the exchanges that affect the cost and character of health care, which most of all, of course, affects millions of people who uh, are in these mammoth systems, which isn't the whole of it. There's a lot more to health insurance than what we're looking at, individual non-group markets, but that's where the big changes are. So Mike, platform is yours. Thank you, Dick. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and if I knew you were going to do that sort of introduction, I, I guess I'd have pre prepared a midterm for you. Um, what we'd like to do is, is walk you through sort of the highlights of what we've done with the, uh, 
with the, uh, the five-state study. Um, as, uh, as Dick has indicated, uh, this is a really a team effort. And, and I have to say, it really sort of relied heavily on, on Alice Rivlin's ability to sort of put all of this together and keep us focused and uh, keep our feet to the fire in answering the questions that we were, we were charged with. And I can't say enough about, uh, about Dick Nathan and his ability to, to sort of put together a, a, a network of field researchers across 40 states, uh, calling people up out of the blue to saying, we're doing this, this interesting project. Would you like to be with us? And people have just joined right in. And then we've got a, a really strong set of, uh, of uh, field investigators throughout these states and as Dick has indicated, across all the states. So what are we about? What we want to do is begin to understand the experiences in the states and how the ACA has affected the insurance exchanges in those, in those areas. We want to describe the, uh, the potentially idiosyncratic nature of the marketplaces in each of the states. And indeed, it was our, our presumption going in that the states were going to be very different. Um, and, and thirdly, we want to, uh, to develop hypotheses about uh, how the, uh, the exchanges have evolved and how they might evolve, and to offer those as, as sort of testable opportunities to other researchers, but also to, to per, perhaps sort of serve as a, as a, as a roadmap for, for all of us as we look at uh, uh, repeal, replace, and repair. There isn't much background that, that I think I have to, to provide for this audience, but there are a couple of, of key things that I think are, are uh, worth focusing on. Um, as we all know, the ACA marketplace has just completed their fourth open enrollment period. Uh, what our field investigators did was to examine all of the open, all of the open enrollment periods from the beginning uh, through the, the opening of this, the, the fourth one. Uh, it's important to appreciate that within the, uh, the ACA, there are rating areas in each of the states. Uh, rating areas are, are geographic areas in which uh, an insurer, uh, if they offer coverage in, in that area, must qu quote the same premium to people of the same age and smoking status. But the thing to appreciate is the states are very different in how they've configured their, uh, their rating areas. Some use individual counties. Others, metro areas are, are, their un are unique rating areas, and the rural uh, counties make up sort of the, the last of the rating areas in the states. And others use geographic sections of the state. But it's important to appreciate that all of the states approach their definitions of the market somewhat differently. And it's important to appreciate that insurers don't have to participate in all of the rating areas, nor do they have to participate in all of the counties within a given rating area. So it, it's important to appreciate just from that, that that states are potentially very different and very different kinds of, of insurance responses within the states because of the flexibility that's granted by, these, by this rating area approach. So why these states? Um, we chose California because it's a democratic state that expanded Medicaid. And it, it adopted a, a state-based exchange of the, the active purchaser variety. And in fact, it's the only state that has, has done that. We chose Michigan. Uh, it's a state with Republican leadership that expanded uh, its Medicaid program in, in late uh, 2014 and adopted a partnership model of, of exchanges. Florida is an oppositional state that, that didn't expand Medicaid and uses the federally facilitated exchange. And the, the, the particularly interesting thing they're going in is it's one of, of two states that in which each county is its own rating area. North Carolina, another uh, uh, state that's that was politically opposed to the ACA. It didn't expand Medicaid. It, too, used a, a federally facilitated exchange. And the reason for wanting to include uh, North Carolina is that there was, there was early evidence there that insurers were, were working with, with local providers to co-brand products that would allow them to compete with the dominant insurer. And we wanted to see how that was working out. Texas is, is indeed an oppositional state. It didn't expand Medicaid either. It uh, uses the federally uh, uh, facilitated uh, exchange. Um, it's also one of the few states that doesn't approve premiums or for that matter assist the exchanges in, in essentially any way. Uh, Early evidence, though, suggested that, that there was uh, the potential, at least, for some substantial competition in, in some areas of the state. And so we wanted to see how that all played out. 
So overall, we've we we looked for some from for some geographical diversity. Uh, as you see from the states, there's also some racial and ethnic uh, diversity in, in all of this. And we looked for places where we had strong uh, research teams. So uh, uh, we've got a, a, what I think is a very good set of, of uh, uh, places to, to observe. A little bit on methods. I mean, I'm, I'm an economist and do a lot of regression kinds of things, and a lot of policy analysts do that same sort of thing. Field research isn't like that. Um, field research actually asks people who, who potentially know something about, and indeed do know something about the, uh, uh, the questions at hand, to talk to people in the communities who know something about what's going on. And so it's, it's an opportunity to sort of build on, on uh, local expertise. Um, the team uh, developed a series of discussion questions. They focused on insurer participation and withdrawal from the, from the markets. Uh, it looked at issues of, of structuring uh, the networks within the, within the uh, insurer plans. And it looked at, at, at changes in the environment that uh, 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 potentially took place as we, as we watched the, uh, the four years unfold. Um, but having said that, it's not just sort of a set of questions that, that, we, that we follow by rote. Um, it's a more fluid discussion that, that follows from the discussion that precedes it into where the, uh, where the issues are from the point of view of the people on the ground. And so we come away with, I think, a very nuanced and, and rich sense of what, uh, what the states look like. Um, the field teams conducted 15 to 90 minute interviews, some in person, some by phone, with health insurers, with providers and provider networks, with state insurance regulators, uh, with insurance agents and brokers, and with navigators, and with other you know, policy experts, sometimes the media in the in the uh, in the states. Now, of course, there's a there's a point of generalizability here. You can't generalize from five states, and particularly you can't generalize from five states when when one of your key conclusions is they're all very different. Um, there are, of course, though, a number of themes that 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 emerge from what we found, and that's what I want to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, now. Uh, first, as, as Dick indicated, uh, the key finding in all of this is that health insurance markets are, are local. Now, I've been looking at health insurance markets for 20 years or more, and it's only in the last four, three, four years, and, and certainly through the, the field work that we've been doing here, that I've appreciated just how local these markets are. It's a mistake to sort of think of... of uh, Idaho as a market. It's a mistake to think of Texas as a market. The, the, the insurance markets are much more local than that. Uh, and what that, what that means is what we found is that there is a lot of, of divergence within the states. Certainly it's the case that the, the extent of competition differs uh, between urban settings and rural settings. Um, but that's just the beginning of it. There are big differences uh, between urban areas. Um, uh, as, uh, as our individual uh, state reports show, uh, it turns out, for example, that the nature of, of insurance competition in, in San Francisco is, is much less intense than it is in Los Angeles. Uh, it's the case that, uh, that Miami is much more competitive than Tampa, that Detroit is more competitive than Flint. Uh, the, the nuances matter, and the nature of the local markets matter. And the reason they matter is because insurers... You know, are, are managed care entities. They form networks. And to be able to be successful in a, in a, in a local market, you have to have a network of hospitals and physicians and, and, and other uh, providers who agree to prices that you believe can make you competitive. And so if it's the case that you can't uh, establish a network, it's you know, well nigh impossible to, to be able to offer an insurance product in that, in that setting. Um, clearly, that's, that's the, the case in lots of rural America. Uh, it's also the case in, in, in modest-sized uh, uh, urban areas. There's a single network, sometimes a single hospital. Um, you decide you want to come in and compete against the, the dominant carrier in the state. You've got to be able to negotiate d meaningful prices with, with that provider. And that turns out to be difficult to do to give you a compar competitive advantage in, in the insurance side. Um, it also turns out to be a problem sometimes in, in large metro areas. 
Uh, in, in Texas, for example, we talked to, to one insurer who said, well, you know, we were pretty successful in putting together what we think was a very good network in, in Houston, but we could never get something to work in Dallas. Uh, so it's not just a matter of sort of we are here, we're in the state, and because we can provide it you know, on the eastern side of the state, we can provide it on the western too. It depends on the local, the local market. Some big implications there. First, it's, it's unrealistic to expect that there you're going to find similar results or indeed that there are similar solutions everywhere. Uh, second, premiums, uh, as we have found, um, are lower in areas where there are greater numbers of hospital and, and, and other providers. Uh, without that, that competition at the, at the provider level, it's difficult to see uh, uh, lower prices at the, uh, at the, at the insurer level. Um, and indeed, we've been told from, from our interviews that, you know, that the decades of consolidation that we've seen going on in, in, the, uh, in the provider markets have made it difficult for, for insurers to compete. Um, having said that, there, if, if indeed these markets are local, that suggests that there's opportunities for, for regional insurers uh, and other insurers who co-brand with, with, uh, with local providers to, uh, to establish a successful niche in their local market where they can compete uh, pretty successfully, or at least uh, we think they can, and we've seen some evidence of that. Um, the other point, though, is if indeed these markets are local and they depend on the nature of, of those, those local networks of providers, that says that, at least to, to us, that, that meaningful, meaningful interstate competition among health insurers uh, may be very difficult to achieve. It's not enough that, that, you know, that, that regulatory barriers are reduced. It's putting together the networks, and that's the, that's the difficult thing. Second major finding. Claims costs substantially exceeded the insurer's expectations. Um, in the first year or two of the, uh, of the exchanges, the insurers actually had very little information. Um, they had been insuring this pool of, of individuals at all. They had some information perhaps from their, from their existing individual market. They had some information from the small group market. Maybe they went to national data like maps. But in any event, they had remarkably little data on, on these individuals. And as a consequence, a lot of them were very timid about entering the market. Um, but after that first year where they saw that, that premiums sort of drove enrollment and that enrollment was relatively low, we saw uh, lots of new entry in, uh, in 2015. Uh, again, on the expectation that, uh, that uh, they could experiment in the market, and we saw entry, and we saw potential for, for real competition there. Um, but then 2016 rolled around, and insurers had data that their actuaries believed, and those data were scary. Uh, they were high utilization, uh, uh, largely across the board, and that led to concerns about high utilization and adverse selection. It led to uh, uh, withdrawal from local markets and from states. And it's important to point out here, it isn't just that you know, some national carriers withdrew from, from full states. It's also the case that, that carriers who remained withdrew from some markets, from some counties and rating areas, uh, and, and withdrew some of the products that they were offering while still remaining in the, in the, in the exchanges. Uh, and it was also the case, as you all know, that we've seen substantial premium increases as a, as a consequence to all of that. The implications of this is that uh, there's, there's certainly an open question as to whether those, those rather large premiums that we've seen in 2017 um, are able to sort of get ahead of the losses that, uh, that the insurers have, have uh, anticipated. Uh, there's concern about the extent of adverse selection relative to the, to the general sickness of the, of the risk pool and what, uh, uh, what uh, carriers are able to do about it. And there's an open question about those, those uh, special late open enrollment provisions. As, as I'm sure you've all heard, there, were, there, were op there are opportunities where people can enroll in, their, in an exchange plan after the open enrollment period closes. And some insurers have argued that that was, a, that was an enormous drain on, on them, uh, uh, that, that late enrollees were, were extraordinarily expensive. Uh, and uh, the, the administration, past and present, are, are sort of working at, at 
alternatives to, to tightening those. And it's an open question as to how meaningful those sorts of, of claims are, both in terms of the original assertions and whether or not changes would make a difference. It turns out that, the, that there were, from, from our review, mounting losses that, that stemmed from high utilization uh, and that, that those, those, those losses can, can overwhelm uh, competition. Uh, in all of our states, we saw the, uh, uh, we saw the withdrawal of, of insurers. Uh, in North Carolina and Texas, some metro areas uh, uh, went from five, to five and nine insurers to suddenly having only three. Uh, Florida had, had three insurers withdraw. Michigan and, and California also saw uh, withdrawal of carriers, so their, their view was that this was, was sort of not as big a problem as, uh, as elsewhere. We saw uh, uh, the, uh, the plateauing of, of uh, uh, alternative forms of insurance innovation. Uh, and certainly insurers have, have viewed that they themselves as having enrolled uh, uh, sicker folks. And that suggests that there's an issue of risk mitigation. Uh, and certainly the, there's view in, uh, across many of our states that, uh, that the risk adjustment mechanism and the, and the short-term other uh, uh, transitional mechanisms were inadequate to deal with the, with the adverse selection that they saw, uh, particularly true in, in Florida and Texas, uh, as, as one insurer uh, told me in Texas. So in the first year, we set our, our premiums relatively high, and we got, a, a, you know, a, in my words, a sick draw of the population. So we lowered our premiums to try to attract more people and a, and a healthier draw, and we did, but six months, and we made money, and then six months later we, we got the, uh, the risk adjustment fee and we lost money. So we set our premiums high and we lose money, we set our premiums low and we lose money, they withdrew from the market. Uh, the risk mitigation matters, ma issues matter. Uh, and, and I think the point there is if we want to, to prohibit insurers from using uh, pre-existing conditions to set premiums, as the ACA does, and as many have said uh, must continue to be the case in the future, that means we have to somehow deal adequately with, with the, uh, the, the risk adjustment, risk mitigation problems. Maybe that's the uh, better funding of, of some of the existing mechanisms. Maybe that means looking at other uh, uh, mechanisms like high-risk pools. Another finding is clearly what we've seen in all this is a shift to narrower networks. Uh, and all of this is well underway. Um, there's, there's very good evidence uh, uh, over the last 20 years that, that uh, narrower networks allow insurers to, to negotiate lower prices with, uh, with providers by essentially trading volume for price. Um, there's clearly, clearly that is in the mind of insurers as they have moved largely from, from PPOs to HMOs. There's an underlying thread in all of this as well, though, and that has to do with whether or not moving to a narrower network uh, can affect uh, adverse selection uh, or your fear of attracting uh, uh, high-risk folks. So if, if one excludes uh, premium providers, um, uh, potentially that leads people with those d related diseases to seek insurance elsewhere. Um, there's some evidence of that, uh, but there's also evidence that premier providers are some of those who have been, have been uh, uh, working with insurers to co-brand. Uh, and it's certainly the case that, that uh, uh, Medicaid managed care plans uh, have while they have their own relatively unique nature of, of their networks, they have also sort of provided uh, uh, access to coverage in some of the premier networks, some of the premier providers, excuse me. So narrower networks uh, continue. Um, there's concern amongst uh, brokers and agents uh, and policy experts that uh, uh, consumers are only beginning to be aware of, the, of uh, what the narrower networks mean to them. Um, there is pretty good, well, actually, there's very good evidence that narrow networks are cost-reducing. But in some sense, um, this, is, this, this can be misleading, given, given the nature of, the, of the, the local markets that we've talked about. Um, as one provider uh, said to us, so, you know, we're the only hospital in town. The insurer moved from a PPO to an HMO. It really didn't have much of an impact here. Outreach 
to consumers may be critical to, uh, to enhancing enrollment. Uh, insurance is complicated, even for those of us who have employer-sponsored coverage. Um, consumers have been largely focused on price, but increasingly the, the, uh, the navigators tell us that they, they, are, they are able to appreciate the nature of deductibles and copays. The new challenges have to do with, with narrower networks, with balanced billing, and with plan withdrawals and having to move from one plan to another. Um, some states have been very good at outreach, Florida in particular, California and North Carolina as well. It's important to also to appreciate that, that uh, it isn't just the navigators that provide information. Safety net providers often play a, a critical role in, uh, in, in opportunities like uh, 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 enrollment fairs to encourage enrollment. Uh, and brokers and agents certainly feel that they have, they have uh, 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 you know, lacked the incentives to be able to participate. The ability to, to increase enrollment in the plans, I think we, we, we conclude, depends critically on the ability to, uh, to have an informed set of consumers and to, to provide mechanisms to do that. Uh, an additional point is that, that insurers may indeed be waiting in the wings. Um, yes, we've seen a lot of withdrawal from the, plan, from the exchanges. But for the most part, insurers who have withdrawn from the exchanges have remained in ACA-compliant off-exchange plans. Uh, much of that has to do with the fact that if you withdraw from, from uh, the state entirely, uh, it's five years before you can come back. And so there's a, there's a sense in many of, the, uh, of uh, the communities we've looked at that insurers have hedged their bets. They've withdrawn from the, from the exchange products, but they've kept off-exchange products uh, there uh, so that they, uh, they can sort of re rejoin the, uh, the fray if the economic and political circumstances change. And so what that suggests is a replaced, repaired ACA uh, may see relatively rapid reentry of insurers. Um, and indeed, that if that's the case, much of that new growth may be local and regional insurers rather than, uh, than national players. The other interesting finding has to do with Medicaid managed care type for insurers. Um, they have been particularly successful where, where the more conventional uh, insurers have, have, uh, have struggled. Um, it's an open question as to why that's the case. Uh, it may, the, the, the Medicaid uh, uh, managed care type insurers tend to have narrow networks made, often made up of, of, uh, uh, special, of, of uh, safety net providers. Um, they also have a, have a, a pool of enrollees who, who often transition back and forth from Medicaid. And the relevant question is to what extent that kind of experience can be generalized to the, to, uh, the rest of the populations and indeed whether or not it, it can. Finally, while the individual states don't sort of talk about the effect of Medicaid expansion per se, when you look across our five studies, what you see is those states where there was a Medicaid expansion, uh, the role of that expansion in the exchanges was, was not discussed. But in the other three states, it was. And the, and the assertion by, by people on the, in the field was that uh, uh, the, a Medicaid expansion would have, would have helped. It would have taken those people at the, at the 100 to 138 percent of the poverty line, put them into Medicaid, and, and arguably taken them out of, the, uh, out of the, uh, the risk pools that the insurers faced. And it may also be the case that, that the provision of uh, a Medicaid expansion brought people in. They discovered they weren't eligible for Medicaid, but they were eligible for a subsidy, and they enrolled. In any event, there seems to be a very uh, strong sense that, uh, that uh, uh, Medicaid expansion matters. There's also a point in, in North Carolina um, that was emphasized about, uh, uh, as you may recall, in the first year of the, uh, the exchanges, states had the option to, to allow noncompliant plans to continue or not. And the argument is by preventing those from, from continuing uh, that uh, uh, mitigated some of the, the potential adverse selection problems. So, future research for us. Um, we think that we need to know a whole lot more going forward about uh, how insurance competition uh, is going to fare post repeal, replace, repair. Uh, do insurers enter? Uh, if they can offer a wider range of coverage, how does this affect availability, premiums, enrollment? Um, 
how do new risk adjustment mechanisms uh, uh, work? Uh, do more flexible uh, interstate insurance opportunities enhance competition, or as, as we fear, uh, not do much? How do local insurance markets evolve? Uh, do local regional insurers grow and prosper? Does uh, uh, continued provider consolidation inhibit competition? What about ACOs? Do they enhance competition? Do they retard it? Um, will we see a rise of co-branding with, with providers? Uh, and what's the future of, of narrow networks? Um, to say the obvious, uh, there's much to learn and little time. Thank you.